Hi, everyone. Welcome back. So this is the second video uh, lecture on exponential growth. So in the first video, I gave you like a big overview of how important exponential growth is. It is ubiquitous from technology to financial markets to population dynamics. Uh, and now in the second video, I'm going to zoom in to kind of work out some systems that exhibit exponential growth. What are the hallmarks? How do we understand these kind of big and growing numbers? Uh, so that's, that's what we're going to talk about now. So when I talk about this in class, I like to think about this in terms of a really, really simple example of a population of bunnies. Okay, so we all know what bunnies like to do. Bunnies procreate. Okay, so if I start out with an initial population of bunnies, let's say two bunnies, um, don't worry about any uh, moral implications of only starting with two bunnies. So if I start out with two bunnies, and we assume that they double every year, then after one year, I have four bunnies. After two years, I have eight. After three years, I have 16. You can see this is getting bigger. Uh, four years, I have 32 bunnies. And very quickly, I have to zoom out because this is growing so fast. So I have uh, 32 bunnies now after four years. Then I have 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, uh, and 2,048 bunnies after 10 years, starting with two bunnies, okay? And this is just gonna keep growing and growing and growing. That's what bunnies do. Uh, and actually, in Seattle this year, or last year, we had a massive explosion of bunnies. They were everywhere. We had bunnies living in every single bush in our neighborhood. Uh, the next year, we had uh, coyotes, actually, okay? So, um, but exponential growth looks like this. And the basic idea here, you can actually write this as an equation where um, essentially you have x at time k plus 1 equals r times x. So x is the bunny population, xk is the bunny population in year k, and xk plus 1 is the bunny population the next year. And r is how much the bunny population increases from year to year. So in our case, we have r equals 2, because the bunny population doubles each year, okay? Um, this is super cool. This is a really, really simple mathematical expression that says that um, essentially the amount of bunnies, the, the, the rate at which bunnies grow is proportional to how many bunnies there are. That makes sense. If two bunnies double, I get two more. But if a thousand bunnies double, I get a thousand more. And that's what this is saying, is that the bigger my population is, the faster it's going to grow. And that's why you get this exponential growth. Okay? So I'm not telling you anything you didn't already know. Uh, we're just kind of writing it down uh, as an equation here. And oftentimes it's useful, instead of plotting uh, kind of on these linear axes like what we're used to, where every tick is the same uh, spacing, oftentimes it's useful to plot in these log coordinates. So the y-axis now uh, is like a log, logarithmically spaced. So every tick in the y direction, I'm actually taking a bigger and a bigger and a bigger step. So from 2 to 8, from 8 to 32, 32 to 128, every time I go up in the y, I'm multiplying by 4. I'm not just adding uh, more, more bunnies. I'm multiplying the number of bunnies. That's what logarithmic coordinates do. And so if you take that same population growth where after one year I have four bunnies, after two years I have eight, and so on and so forth, you see that on these log coordinates, your exponential growth turns into this nice straight line. And this is much easier to visualize and to see kind of all of the scales of growth over time in these log coordinates. So you're going to see that a lot when you look at uh, data from a system that's growing exponentially. It's much more useful to plot it this way than this way oftentimes. Okay? Um, there's a really fun story that I've always liked ever since I was a little kid about exponential growth, just to give you kind of a feeling for, for this. Um, there's this story about how chess was invented and how uh, the inventor of the game of chess presented this uh, to their king. And the king was so delighted because this is such a great game of strategy um, that he told the inventor, you name the reward and I will grant it to you. And so the inventor of chess was very clever, maybe too clever, and he said, here's my reward. All I require, all I ask, is that you give me one grain of wheat for the first square, and you give me two grains of wheat for the second square, and four for the third square, and double the grains of wheat for every square. Now the king thought this was a marvelous deal, immediately said, yes, uh, that's a, you know, that's a deal, wonderful. 
Uh, and it was only weeks later when uh, the king was told that all of the granaries were empty and the kingdom was going to starve uh, and that they couldn't pay the inventor that they realized something was wrong. You know, after 20 or 30 of these squares, you get into, you know, more grains of wheat than there are in an entire kingdom. And doing what any reasonable, rational king would do at the time, he ordered the inventor uh, executed as a lesson to anyone else who would try to outsmart uh, a king. Now, I've always loved that story because it's such a simple concept that if you double just a few times, you can get astronomical numbers quickly. And in fact, astronomical, um, there's this great Richard Feynman quote that uh, you know, astronomical numbers used to be really big, but now the national deficit is larger <laughs> than the number of stars in the galaxy, and so we should call them economical numbers. But I love this example because it shows how big things get fast when you double, when you exponentiate, okay? Um, another example that I like to talk about is, you know, things don't just grow exponentially, they can also decay exponentially. So this is a case of radioactive decay, where if you had a radioactive element, if you had some mass of, you know, plutonium or uranium or whatever, um, XK, and I'm going to pick an element, a magical element that has a half-life of exactly one year, then from year to year, you would take your mass and divide it by two, uh, and that would tell you kind of how that radioactive material changes in time. So if you start with 40 grams of this material, the next year you'll have 20 grams, the next year you'll have 10 and 5 and so on and so forth. And very rapidly you'll have a minuscule amount of this radioactive material just because of the power of exponential decay. Okay, So dividing by 2 a lot also gets you very, very small numbers, just like multiplying by 2 got you really, really big numbers. Okay. Uh, except I think this is kind of fun. If you take enough of these radioactive uh, elements and you put them really, really close together, when one of them decays, it might hit two others and cause them to decay. And those two others cause four others to decay. And very quickly, if you have a critical mass, uh, you end up achieving fission and you get, again, exponential growth until all of that material uh, has, has kind of uh, decayed or fizz fissioned uh, in this explosion, okay? So I think that's kind of a fun example. So there are two extremes. You can have exponential growth where your population doubles. You can have exponential decay where your population, population halves. Uh, most of my examples I'm going to talk over here about this kind of growth, but you know, it's really the same mathematical equation just with a different constant uh, from year to year. Okay, um, and then going back to Moore's law of, you know, increasing density of transistors in computers or the increasing number of transistors in computers, you can see that over decades, over, you know, I don't know, five decades, this has very, very nicely followed this log linear progression. So you'll notice here the y-axis is on a logarithmic scale. And so the fact that this is linear in these logarithmic coordinates means that the, the number of transistors has been exponential for over 50 years, which is remarkable. Moore defined this law in 1965 with this much information, and it's been true uh, for, the, for the next 50 years. I mean, that blows my mind uh, that Moore's law is true, first of all, but that Moore predicted it uh, that far ago. Very cool. Um, I love this quote by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle because it kind of explains Moore's Law in a way. The more we progress, the more we tend to progress. And this is true in most fields of science and technology, is that the larger our scientific, our, our base of knowledge is, the faster our knowledge grows. The larger our technological base is, the faster our technology grows. And so he says we draw compound interest on the capital of knowledge, which has been accumulated since the dawn of time. And I think that's just an absolutely wonderful uh, sentiment and quote, and it really does explain a lot of what we observe in science and technology. Okay, um, exponential growth of money. I think this is really cool. Um, you know, ever since I was a little kid, I've loved numbers. I've loved big numbers. And part of what fascinated me and got me excited about math, you know, even when I was a little, little kid, was money and just kind of playing with, you know, dollars and cents. I thought this was super fun. And so this is one of my favorite examples of exponential growth. Um, and I'm going to use this in, in future examples. So I want to walk through a really, really simple toy example where we're going to 
have $100 and we're going to put it in a bank. Okay, And we're going to assume that we have a really great bank that gives a 5% return each year. Okay, that's I haven't, I haven't found that bank, but uh, let's say we have a bank that'll give us a 5% return each year. But I'm not gonna reinvest my returns. Okay, so in the first year, I have $100, and after one year, I have $105. But what I'm going to assume is that I'm gonna take that $5, and I'm going to spend it. I'm going to buy some gum or some coffee or something, okay? And then I'm going to take my base $100, and I'm going to get another $5 after the next year, and I'm going to spend that one. And then after the next year, I'll get another $5, and so on and so forth. And after 40 years, what you can expect is that you will have a cumulative amount of money of $300. You have your original $100, and then every year for 40 years, you get another $5 because of that interest, but you didn't reinvest that $5. Okay, so $300 total. And I'm picking 40 years because that is kind of a reasonable work span. If you start working at 25 and you stop working at 65, you have a good 40 years to kind of invest and to, to make money on your money, okay? This is not reinvesting. There's no compound growth here. But if you reinvest that $5 you make every year, something magical happens. Okay, so now we're gonna take the same bank, but every time we get $5, we're gonna put that back in the bank and it's gonna compound interest. Okay, so in the first year, nothing changes. I go from $100 to 105, I made $5, exactly the same. But after the second year, that $5 is also getting 5% interest, and so instead of $110, I get $110 and one quarter. Now that doesn't seem like a big deal. That extra quarter, you might leave that on the ground if you were walking by. But this extra quarter makes all the difference in the world over 40 years. Over 40 years, what I'll get is 704 total dollars in my bank account if I reinvest that 5% that five every year. And so that's pretty remarkable. If I don't reinvest, I get $300. If I do reinvest, I get more than twice as much uh, return after 40 years. And this is the miracle of, of compound interest and exponential growth. Um, and it's something that, that still fascinates me. I think it's really easy for us to think that that quarter doesn't make a difference, but it makes a huge difference. And I, I like this Einstein quote because this um, kind of, you know, Einstein was, was a, a, a titan. Uh, you know, he, he did great things in physics, and his quote, you know, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. And I think that's really cool that, you know, he recognized how powerful compound interest is. It drives markets. It drives economies. It shapes the world we live in. It, it defines who, whose money grows and whose doesn't. Um, and I think that's kind of cool. So if you go back to this plot of the long-term growth in the gross domestic product, the GDP of the US, we see that this really is very nearly exponential in time, even if uh, you account for great depressions and recessions and stock market crashes. And if you plot this in log coordinates like what we've been talking about, you see that you get this very nice log linear growth in, uh, in the GDP. Okay, so uh, that just gives you a flavor for some of the many, many systems that exhibit exponential growth. Um, if you look at bacteria in a petri dish, for a while they will grow exponentially. If you look at uh, a disease that crosses a continent and it goes to a fresh population, it's gonna grow exponentially for a time. Lots and lots of systems grow exponentially. Um, so in the next videos, I'm gonna tell you about uh, why it's called exponential growth, what is, ex what is the exponential. We're gonna talk about Euler uh, and Euler's constant E. Uh, and I'm also gonna talk to you about what causes exponential growth to eventually stop growing exponentially. Nothing can really grow exponentially forever, so we're gonna talk about kind of what curtails exponential growth. So that's all coming up. All right, thank you.